Uh, my name is Tom de Ridder. I'm the CTO from a company called Style Labs. And we built M, the marketing content hub. Uh, this session is going to be about machine learning. It's a bit of a hot topic uh, today, but machine learning inside digital asset management. Is it something that we can use? Can we do something interesting with machine learning inside a DAM? Uh, it's going to be a little bit of theory first. I hope you don't fall asleep. I have some demos near the end uh, to show some of the stuff in action. So first some definitions. So what is machine learning actually? Uh, this is the Wikipedia definition, you can read that. But basically it is, we serve a computer a whole lot of data and it's going to be able to program itself. So no more human interaction, no more people writing code. The computer writes its own code based on a lot of data that it recognizes. That's what machine learning basically is. Since the 50s and the 60s, uh, machine learning has been there for, for over half a century. Uh, so what, what is it that we suddenly see so much machine learning applications like Siri is there, uh, computer vision recognition, self-driving cars, it's all happening in the last four to five years. So there's a reason for that. So although the concepts uh, exist for a long time, it's now that we have some additional breakthroughs in deep learning. Actually in 2012, a couple of guys at Google uh, made some breakthroughs with a whole lot of YouTube videos and uh, like 16,000 servers they were able to uh, automatically teach a computer to recognize a cat without ever saying that it was a cat. That was a major breakthrough in neural networks and obviously also today we actually have the data. There's an enormous amount of data out there and we also have the CPU to actually recognize these patterns which we didn't 20 years or 30 years ago. So today is the era and it's, it's the breakthrough era and we'll be, see, we'll be seeing much more coming in the coming years. Uh, so machine learning, actually if, you, if you're saying yeah, what's, what's AI, what's artificial intelligence and what's, what's deep learning, so artificial intelligence is the umbrella name, started 50 years ago and then we started out with machine learning in the 90s, first applications were spam detection, stuff like that and in the last years we're actually doing deep learning with neural networks we try to mimic the human brain and then we'll, we're able to do computer vision detection and stuff like that that's much more complicated than what we did uh, 20 years ago so this is about this is kind of the timeline to situate everything does this scare anybody right now already it's one person that's scared you're not alone second person is scared it does scare some famous people Elon Musk, Stephen Hawking and Bill Gates are all freaked out for this new autonom auto automatically killing machines. Uh, so what did we see happening? Last month actually there was a pact signed by a few big ones. Amazon, Facebook, Google, IBM and Microsoft. They signed a partnership around artificial intelligence. Not to agree on technology but also to see if it's going to be good and fair for the human race. So that's a big step uh, forward. So, and this is serious. And this is only a month ago. So um, more of this is coming. So we're going to go a little bit technical into machine learning. What, what is it actually and how do we do it? So there's four, four steps actually. First of all, we need data. Second of all, we need pattern detection. We need to detect or the computer needs to detect patterns inside the data and then it's going to build its own model to be able to do predictions. What are predictions? So uh, a prediction is, for example, uh, is this email spam or not? That's a prediction based on a model that's been trained by looking at millions and millions of emails. So the data are the emails, the pattern is what the computer actually uh, looks for uh, using different algorithms and then it creates a model to predict the future. First of all data. Do we have data? Right now we have data. We used to have a little bit of email but today we have an enormous amount of data. I'm not, not even going to read this number but that's what's produced every day in bytes. So it's, uh, it's a lot and there's a lot of secrets in, in these bytes actually. 
which you cannot see anymore with the human eye. So we need the computer to actually look into that data. And not just the computer, we need, we need millions of cores and CPUs to detect patterns inside this data. I'm going to do a little game with you. This is just a little bit of data, like 10 rows of data. Um, and so what we want is we want to create a model to do fraud detection, whether something is fraudulent or not. And then if somebody can come up with the model to predict when is a transaction going to be fraudulent, you win something. <laughs> Don't be scared, raise your hand. Is it because the credit card was issued in the USA? No, because there's some credit cards issued in the USA that are non-fraudulent. Is it because it's, it's young guys, it's people in their 20s? No, because there's, there's the 20-year-old guy that has a non-fraudulent detection. So if you look at it close enough, you will see that it's people in their 20s, issued in the USA, used in Russia, that it's going to be a fraudulent um, transaction. So you, you were able to spot this by just looking at this. So now imagine a million of records. It's going to be more and more difficult. And imagine uh, 265 columns instead of 12. So you can see where this is going. And this is, this is old school machine learning. This is what we did in the 90s, but it's just to detect uh, to give you an idea. So, so how do we actually uh, tell the machine to try and detect these patterns? So we feed it algorithms. And there's many algorithms out there, and most of them are statistical algorithms. And uh, to look at just a, a simple statistical algorithm, we're going to look at a regression. A regression is, uh, are two things correlated. So there's a bunch of data here. Uh, for example, in the right um, charts, I have the quarterly change in GDP versus the unemployment rate. And so we have all of this data and it generates points. And then through a regression analysis, we're able to draw a line. And this line is going to be our model. The model where we can predict the unemployment rate by looking at a change in GDP in a certain country. So this is data, pattern detection through statistical analysis, drawing a line, which is the model, and then doing predictions based on that model. The model is like a, it's like a straight line, it's a function. You can put something in it and it comes out. Uh, but then, more complicated uh, if we're going to do machine learning. So, um, we can use this model now to build applications. For example, for the fraud detection, it needs to live scan all transactions and then check whether this is fraudulent or not, or could be fraudulent. So, uh, usually what comes out of a model is something between 0 and 1. This means 1 is almost true, is true, and 0 is not true. And then something in between is going to be like not, uh, 0.9 will be 90% true. Um, so that's usually the outcome of a model. So just the feedback, uh, just some, some reiteration here. So we need a lot of data. Obviously we need to prepare the data a little bit so that it's all in, in the same form. Then we apply our algorithms to detect patterns. We get a candidate model, and then we reiterate until we actually have a model that, that works. We deploy this model, and then we can build applications of this model that was not programmed. I want to remind you, we didn't program the model. The computer programs its own models based on the data. It gets smarter by itself, not by human interaction. Um, some recaps, you will get the slides later, so uh, this is what I said. Obviously, important to, to do a prediction is you do have to understand your business. Something between zero and, and one will come out, so 20%. What does that even mean to me? If, if a transaction is fraudulent, 20%, is that scary or not? Or do we have to wait until it's 60% before we call the customer? So you have to understand your business to be able to do something with that prediction. That's also very important. A few example applications, fraud detection, spam filtering, OCR. Do we all know what OCR is? I guess so. Yeah. So we, we can actually have a printed letter and then reverse engineer what the original text was. Uh, speech recognition. 
the Siri's and the Google Homes and the Amazon Echoes of the world. Speech recognition, I did my thesis on speech recognition in the 90s. Wasn't all that good. Was, uh, was actually with a Belgian company called uh, Lernout and Houseby uh, that went bankrupt. Uh, so back in the time, those algorithms were based on, on checking letter per letter what the speech could be. Right now we actually have neural networks that look at the whole wave and then try to refine it as we go. And it's much more accurate than it was. So you, you've all tried some of the series of the world. It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. It's pretty good, I think, uh, nowadays. Search engines also use a lot of, of uh, machine learning. Does anybody have an idea uh, what a search engine could be using? Correcting your search term? Yeah, probably. That's a good one. Determining whether or not a given site is malicious? Yeah, also correct. So all of those things um, are, are interesting ways to, to allow the computer to be smarter and smarter. Computer vision, that's uh, subject detection, what's in images, but not only that. Uh, also for self-driving cars, for example. Uh, there will be cameras on those cars and they need to detect every millisecond what's going on. All right, now let's shift to the dumb business. So is this all interesting in dumb or not? So what, what can we even do with it? So we've learned that one of the first things we need to be able to build or to detect a pattern is a lot of data. Do we have a lot of data in a dumb? You might say, yeah, our dumb is big. We have a million records in our dumb. But I hate to disappoint you, a million records is not going to be nearly good enough to build a decent algorithm. So to do auto classification based on your own images, it's not going to be good enough. Something else, analytics. There's a lot of people using our dumb and downloading. Can we, can we be able to do like Netflix based recommendations? So if you download this, you might also be interested in this. Uh, I downloaded, so we have a customer that has a lot of clients. There's like four or 5,000 users on the system every day and they download and I've gathered the analytics from six months and I tried to build a recommendation algorithm. I only got bad recommendations. So even that is not good enough. So if you're just going to rely on your own data in your dumb, it's not big data, it's just data. So we need to find something else to help us a little bit. So luckily there's some generic models on image detection and image recognition that we can use. Uh, and there's a couple of players out there, uh, Microsoft, Google, and uh, some third-party companies all have uh, generic image recognition models based on billions of images to try and, and do subject detection. That's something that we can use. Unfortunately, those are generic models. So this means they're able to detect anything in an image. So if you're doing very, something very uh, peculiar, it's not going to be able to do a detection. So if you want to detect uh, like pack shots of, of your brand, it's going to be hard. If you just have marketing pictures with people on it, it will do a much better job. So those are generic images. You can refine and train a generic image to come a little bit more specific, like food, for example. Uh, but again, you need a lot, a lot of training material. We'll look at some of those uh, examples uh, in computer vision. So the typical things I do is subject detection. That's uh, an interesting one. People hate to classify manually. Uh, so if it detects the text out there and, and you could do something like all of the text with a probability above 60%, automatically apply them. And then for everything under it, uh, let me manually do a, a check. It's gonna save you a lot of time. Not only a lot of time, it's probably gonna do a better job than you because there might be a picture with blue sky. You might not think of blue sky computer will say blue sky. So it's going to be more complete than what you do. Second thing is color detection. Uh, detecting highlights, background colors, all of that thing. Uh, interesting to do matching uh, colors um, with machine learning. Face recognition. That's also something that's uh, been uh, interesting and been bu being built into a lot of client applications like iPhoto and even on your Mac. Uh, face recognition, and uh, this is Sting and his wife Trudy, and we'll see in a minute. Uh, so in, in here she's uh, 47 and Sting is 59, 
but they're actually about the same age. I think Sting is a little bit older. And so we'll see. Uh, I did this again yesterday and it's already improved. So this is six months ago. Uh, sentiment detection. Is, is this person looking angry or something like that? OCR also again. So something else that we can do is uh, textual content, subject detection, uh, sentiment detection of a text, translating. Also pretty interesting, I think, for metadata features in digital asset management. And fragment highlighting. Video. I see Nick here. So there's more to images. Video is not just a series of images. That's how it will actually work. So it will try to scan all of the images, but there's also something like activity that can be detected over a course of time. And that's not detectable in the image, but you need the series of images to be able to predict the action going on. So there's also um, spatial recognition in, um, in video. So progressing week by week. So you've seen here 47.59. Then in November, uh, she became the exact picture, 57 and, and Sting became, became also 57. Sting is actually 65, I think, and Trudy is uh, uh, 59. So it's becoming more accurate. Uh, and it's self-learning. Nobody's actually doing this, but every day the algorithm and the model gets refined. I'm going to do a little shootout here. So I've uploaded uh, a couple of pictures on the most uh, promising engines, uh, the Microsoft one and Google one and the Clarify one. So you can see here what they thought about this image. So Microsoft is the only one who actually comes up with a description. The other ones just do text. So it's thinking that it's a close-up close up of a sandwich on a plate, which in my opinion is pretty accurate. And it does this for many pictures. Uh, and then there's a couple of tags there. Um, Google does more tags and Clarify does some, some more specific tags. So this was in June. So let's see what it did in November. And I've put the June results next to it. So Microsoft pretty much stayed the same. Uh, cooked, got switched in for snack food. Uh, Google made some big process here, so it said pot roast, but it found out it's pulled pork after five months. So, improvements, I think. Cheesesteak, lunch, street food, hamburger, all of those things that weren't there in June. Clarify also has a bunch more tax, and you can see this is, I'm using the general model, but Clarify also just launched a food model 1.0. And if I feed it to the food model, it's actually detecting coleslaw, specific items in there. So that's, that's why you think it's, it's important to use the right model. A generic model will only give you generic stuff. Uh, if you can have a specific, a specific model, you'll get more accurate results for that application. A brioche, which is a sweet bun. OCR shootouts. Um, I've, I've fed this. Uh, traffic picture into Google. Uh, the only thing it doesn't do is it's not detecting the O in only, exit only, while Microsoft does. So now look at it. Yesterday, it says Kir. What is Kir? There's this Kia on the car. <laughs> Low there, so it's detecting that. And now the only becomes a, a little zero here, so it's, it's getting smarter. Uh, no changes in the Microsoft uh, detection. Face recognition and emotion detection. Uh, I've run this to, through Google. Uh, I don't get percentages there, I just get possible or unlikely or very unlikely. So it looks like she's angry, which in my opinion is not right. She doesn't seem angry. Microsoft is more correct there. There's a 71% here that is disgust which I think is, is more accurate. Don't be bothered by the happiness here, it's 1.1, but there's an E minus seven there. And we all know from when we were younger that that means something. You have to shift the zeros to the right. So disgust is uh, pretty accurate here. So computer vision, interesting future. It's not just about doing some nifty social media tricks. There's actually going to be some interesting applications in the future, like maybe x-rays, MRIs and CT scans, medical applications, that the computer will be able to detect stuff better than your radiologist. 
whether you have cancer or not, uh, will be a computer decision instead of a human decision, not a decision. We'll find it out. Robotics are becoming more and more interesting. Uh, we see vacuum cleaners already riding down our houses, uh, so those robotics will become more and more interesting. We'll also rely on, on uh, computer vision. Uh, drones that fly themselves. Amazon is talking about it since, since a couple of years already, that they want automatic drones delivering packages to your houses. Self-driving cars, Elon Musk has been promising it. Uh, all new Teslas since, I think, uh, one month ago have a whole new camera system in it that's activated, but it's not intervening yet, so they're going to wait for the approval uh, after doing a million miles and then putting it in front of the government, and then they will activate it, and they say it will be much safer than you driving. So all of this is coming, and you should actually be scared. It's not just a joke anymore, uh, and I've seen it improving. I've been following this for the last four years, and it's been improving. It's, it's exponentially, month after month. So watch out for the future. Uh, second thing that I said, uh, machine learning for digital asset management, recommendations. Could be interesting uh, that if we have a whole lot of people that are downloading stuff that we can make recommendations to any new guy that comes onto the system. Ah, I've seen you playing around for a day. Maybe this and this and this would interest you also. Unfortunately, and I've spent some time on this, I built this crazy model. It's called the Matchbox model. And you can look it up. It's a Matchbox model for recommendations. It's, what's, it's what they use in Netflix. Um, and like I said, results were not good. So my data wasn't big enough. And also, I don't know how, how you perceive Netflix recommendations. I personally don't find them very good. And this is already coming from all of the downloads in the world. And they're still a little bit sloppy, I think. So there's improvement to be done there. And I think right now, it's not going to be uh, a good application for, for them. But as we, as we know, neural networks um, become smarter and smarter. And they need less data to become more effective. So in the near future, we might be able to do something with less data um, and a good, a good algorithm. We're going to do a couple of live demos here uh, and then move into some questions. So I've just prepared. So we've, we've uh, actually integrated our system with the Microsoft um, vision tools. So I'm going to just drop a couple of pictures here and see what it does with them. No Wi-Fi isn't too incredible, but... So now it's processing them in the cloud. And then we'll go over them once we see some thumbnails. So it's just a picture of our booth and of the competition next to us. And so we can see what it found out. So some of the color detection here, uh, whether it's adult or racy, that's both false. And you can see that the scores are low there. Um, Tags, indoor, table, sitting, laptop, computer, screen, people, top. Uh, a laptop that is on display. Where does that come from? So probably this tablet here that's been displayed. And then the OCR recognition. Uh, so it does found 360 degrees marketing content management for the enterprise. And then the competition management, it's probably because of the italics in there. Uh, chaos to control, get control of your dumb blah, blah, blah. Uh, cool thing is that this then immediately works in, in full text search. So if I now search for like uh, chaos, the picture is actually coming out. So I didn't have to do anything. Uh, just allow the OCR engine. It's that picture, but the actual binary is not coming. Let's look at a couple of other pictures here. Go to my create again. Mm. 
Let's look at these guys. Computer analyzed data. Uh, person, suit, man, clothing, necktie, outdoor. But watch this. Captions, Donald Trump, Barack Obama posing for a picture. So it actually also detects famous people. It, it kind of figured out itself that people sometimes have a name and then that's detected. So now I can search immediately for, for Trump and he will pop up. What's the sentiment analysis there? <laughs> um, There's two males in there, so uh, I guess this is Obama, he's 51, and then the other guy, 72, which I think is accurate. Um, and then, yeah, it's, it's not really adult or racy here. And the dominant colors are all black. The future is black. <laughs> anyway. Let's look at one more. See if it detected this guy. I didn't test this. Yep, but it says Elon Musk holding a phone. Is he actually holding a phone? No. Looked like he was holding something, but but it's detecting Elon Musk. Um, I'm gonna. Does yep. he use the file name at all? No. Nope. Yeah, it says MUSK9, but it doesn't use, and so I can look at the embedded metadata also here, whether it's going to be in the EXIF or in the IPTC. But there's no Elon in here, so it detected it purely from the neural pixels and then went from model to model. Um, so I think this is a pretty interesting application for just images and OCR. Um, Video is coming, but video is much more complicated than just a still, obviously. Uh, we could run it now through, uh, unless you guys have questions, because I have five more minutes, uh, I could run the same pictures to some other engines to see what they say about it, or you could ask me some questions if, if you're interested. While you think of your questions, I will upload them anyway. Do this. Does your data model also consider, um, if the user has the ability to change something that the computer thought it was, does it also consider, oh, so many people have changed this, so it's probably this instead? Uh, we don't write it back to uh, the Microsoft Cloud, but that's uh, something we could do, obviously. Um, so it gets smarter by just looking at the internet. It doesn't use our application data to learn. Uh, then you cannot use a generic model. If Microsoft opens it up and there's other third parties that open up the model to be installed on your premises, and then you can do that feedback loop uh, of, of corrections uh, into the data. But like I said, five corrections are not going to be enough for it to change its model. You're going to need a million people saying that it's something else. Where is Microsoft harvesting all the data from? Bing. I have Bing, and that's why they just feed Bing to the neural network and then get it out there. Google all started this actually and then... I was going to say, I think Google would have a bigger than Microsoft. Yeah, Google probably has bigger and you've seen that, that uh, but it's not, it's not just the data, it's also the algorithm obviously. And uh, yeah, uh, they're, they're both, both Microsoft and Google have interesting data and you don't need, there's, there's a lot, but there's enough for them to be pretty fine. There's a couple of other companies that don't have that much data and you see that they are on the losing hand. Yeah, Apple Maps is almost sort of gripping out the road. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Mark? So you own Azure, you've got a relationship with Microsoft and you're bringing product Project Boxes and some other APIs, but why would a customer wanting to use Google's API, Firefox, for instance, could they do that? Yeah, that's just interchanging the, the worker to post its data to another. It's all RESTful. So we just post the image to Microsoft and get the JSON back. We could also just post it to Google and get the JSON back from Google. So it's not, this is what it ships with out of the box, but changing that is, is very easily. So it's not built inside our engine. 
you need way too much cores to be able to do this. So it's, that's why, if you notice that if you do Siri and you're not online, it's not actually working because it's not your phone processing the voice, it's the cloud doing it for you. So it's, you still need a lot of computing power. People say it's gonna be in your phone. It's, it's not in your phone yet. Um, I'm just wondering in terms of uh, enterprise data that you might have that relate to marketing activity that leverages you know, those assets. Um, is there a way to incorporate the enterprise data related to that activity um, yep. along with you know, the third party? That, that indeed is a much more interesting uh, topic and there's mo much more data on the right hand side of what people are clicking on uh, on your websites and your newsletters. Uh, but there's already a lot of analytics tools at that side that will already perform uh, the model and the prediction and then feed that result back to the DAM to do ROI searches is, is a use case that we often do a lot. But we don't reanalyze the data. It's already analyzed in, that, in those channels uh, for us by the Googles and the analytics engines that uh, are living there. And there indeed, uh, if, if you generate enough traffic, uh, then there's something interesting to do to predict the next email I'm going to send to this customer uh, instead of having a hard-coded algorithm in your email engine uh, you could indeed use some of the of the machine learning okay for this touch point for this guy between 20 and 21 in Argentina uh, I'm gonna now send him this email because I learned it myself instead of a marketer telling me this but not yet but soon. All right, that concludes this session. Thank you all for being here.